Welcome to the Money Answer Show with host Jordan Goodman. Whether you are starting out, deep into your retirement, or somewhere in between, the Money Answer Show has the know-how to help you. Now here's your host, Jordan Goodman. Welcome to the Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour is Adam Fortuna. Uh, He is a blogger and writer at the website Minify, which is designed to help millennials invest to reach financial independence much sooner than they ever thought possible. Welcome to the Money Answer Show, Adam. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Just tell us your background a little bit and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, so um, I don't have a financial background myself. During my career, I was a a software developer and a product manager. Uh, But when I was about 23 years old, uh, I just graduated college. About three months after that, my mom passed away and left me about $100,000. And at that point, I was like, what the hell do I do this, do with this? I had never uh, really learned anything about investing in school other than like maybe a little bit about like how the stock market works in general, but not really how to grow wealth. And so that kind of opened up this can of worms for me early on of uh, learning everything I could about how to invest responsibly and uh, grow that and turn that windfall into something that could uh, set me up better for later than uh, if I had just left it in a savings account. Okay. So you're part of the so-called FIRE movement, is that correct, which is the financial independent retire early movement? Is that fair to say? <laughs> yeah, I'd say that's fair to say. I, so- uh, Yeah, I just uh, about a year, a little over a year ago, I left my job to hopefully retire early. I, I have a feeling we're going to get into some of that That hopefully on this show today. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that's uh, the idea, the financial independence side, having enough money to potentially be set for the rest of your life. Of course, you never know. And uh, yeah, we'll see if this uh, this coronavirus thing tests that, that assumption. Yeah. So let's just talk about your view of the FIRE movement. It came along kind of quickly. How realistic is it for a lot of people, if they take the advice that you're giving out in your blogs and your writings, that they actually would be able to retire early um, and be financially independent? Yeah, that's it's a it's a big it's it's a wide net on who it can apply to and how it can apply to people. I think uh, looking at it at the high level, like very few people, I think like less than one percent of people retire before they're like sixty. So if you consider early before you're 60, then early retirement by saving a little bit, by being a little bit mindful about your spending, you know, um, just uh, understanding what you're spending and not letting it creep up year to year, that can reduce your your uh, maybe retirement date from 65 down to 60. And then I think about it in like incremental steps, like every little bit you do might shave off a couple of years. Like if you're able to invest on your own rather than with a financial advisor and get similar returns, maybe you can uh, knock that 60 down to 55. And maybe if you can uh, track your spending and make sure it doesn't increase uh, in excess of inflation, then maybe you can knock that 55 down to 50. So it's all these little steps that you can take that can knock off years. I think it's somewhat rare for people to be able to reach that in their 30s unless they had an extremely high paying job or were in a position where they were able to uh, invest from an early age, like like I kind of had that opportunity to do. So I think early in the sense of 40s and 50s is much more realistic than early in your 30s or 20s. I mean, there's two sides to it. One is the increasing your income through investing correctly, and the other side is dramatic cuts in your expenses and your lifestyle. So let's talk about that part. Have you done things and what do you recommend that people can do to dramatically cut their living expenses? Yeah, that's that's really a big part of it because, yeah, it it's all comes down to the spending versus savings equation. And uh, I think for us, we have actually haven't concentrated on cutting our spending that much. I think uh, in terms of people in the fire community, we're probably some of the biggest spenders out there. <laughs> like I, I've uh, shared some of my my spending numbers and I think we're spending like 80,000 a year for my wife and I and no kids. And that's, I mean, that's a lot for a lot of people in the fire community. But uh, I think we, we, uh, we really focused on like building the life 
we wanted and the spending level that made us really happy, uh, you know, what that allowed us to do in terms of travel, giving, flexibility, and then started saving enough to uh, meet that 80000 a year spending habit going forward. But so, yeah, in terms, oh yeah, in terms of things we cut, um, it, uh, it was really just uh, spending in accordance with our values, like not spending on <laughs> first class airfare when we can uh, get a flight on points, or not, uh, um, you know, doing a full house remodeling when we can instead live in an apartment for for relatively cheap. So your whole concept is minimalist, as you call it, right? What is minimalism and how can the average person go from where they are to a minimalist life and still have a decent life yeah there's a there's a fine line between like uh feeling like you have enough even though it's very little and you are needing for things and you're (laughs) very little like i think about when i was in college i was living a minimalist life but it wasn't really by choice it was really out of necessity There's a a difference now um, for a lot of people after they are out of college and they're in their earning years and they're trying to like mindfully choose what they want. And uh, one of the things I like is the idea that everything in your house is either uh, useful or beautiful or that you find beautiful. And that kind of helps kind of limit out, you know, buying a as seen on TV device that you might only use once or twice. And focusing in on kind of everything when you look around your house having a job. And it's not something that only, um, you know, only millennials or only people without kids can have a minimalist house. Uh, we have a friend of ours who has three kids married. And their their household, when you look around, it is very minimalist. I mean, there's a, a ton of toys for the kids, of course. But uh, aside from that... Um, Everything has a use, and uh, yeah, so it can happen at kind of any household level. Yeah. So the whole fire movement started in the middle of a massive bull market where you could make great returns on the stock market. Let's talk about the current situation where we've had a bear market now, market where the stocks are falling sharply because of the whole what's going on with the uh, coronavirus. How is the bear market going to affect the fire movement? Yeah, I think uh, that'll remain to be seen in the next couple of years. But uh, one of the one of the ways that the fire community is kind of segmented is into kind of three camps of how much you need to save. It's kind of like the the lean fire group, which is like save twenty five x your uh, yearly spending and retire on that. It's it's very like bare bones. There's very little room for flexibility if something like this happens. And I think those are the people that are probably going to struggle the most in this situation if they can't either lower their expenses or if they didn't already have, let's say, um, three years of expenses already in cash for them to use. Because uh, right now, if you're in a position where you had 25 times your spending and then the market goes down, let's say, 40%, <laughs> now you have, let's say, 16x of your spending and you're drawing out money to just live every month, uh, you might find yourself in a dangerous position in a year or two. But if you have, you know, 25 to 30x and you have three years in cash, then you have, let's say, three years for the market to recover a little bit before you start taking any money out of the stock market. And that that situation is kind of where our household's at right now, where we, uh, after we retired, we set aside about three years in cash and we're using that so a lot of it, we won't know until three years from now whether or not the market's able to recover from this uh, bear market and this this uh, crash that we're going through right now. Is there a third group of fire people or just those two groups? Yeah, the third group would uh, usually be called like fat fire. <laughs> it's this idea that you're retiring with um, maybe in excess of 33 times your spending. It could be like 35 or 100 times your spending. And those people, I have a feeling they're going to be fine. It just doesn't seem very realistic for most people to even do 10 times their spending, never mind 35 times their spending. Yeah, it's it's something that takes many, many years, a good window to your back through a, um, 
uh, a healthy stock market. And yeah, just constantly throwing your money in into the stock market and hoping it goes up. I think for people who are maybe just getting into fire in the last you know, three years, basically, because right now the stock market's basically down to where it was at the beginning of, I think, 2017, like four years right. ago. Right. And and so uh, anyone who's gotten in the market since then into this fire movement is probably seeing their expenses or their in, their investments below what they paid for them. Right. And yeah, they're going to, you know, potentially have longer before they can make it to that 25x point. One of the points you like to make is you should not try to time the market. So is that true even in a dramatic case like this where in a month you've gone from the all-time record highs to 35 40% down? You say you should keep your plan going anyway even though you've had such a dramatic change. Yeah, there I think I think that still makes sense not to try to time the market. I know I wasn't able to predict when the market would be at its peak and likewise I can't predict when the market's going to be at its trough either. And uh, so if I were, um, you know, working at a job right now and getting a steady paycheck, I would just be stuffing more and more money as I earned it into the stock market, not trying to time the moment where it gets to the bottom. Instead, I would just put in money every two weeks. And some of that money would probably... Uh, go down and then eventually hit the bottom and then eventually start going back up. Uh, if I think that would change if I had like a huge windfall <laughs> right now, like for someone that let's say just inherited a ton of money today, um, I would probably choose something like dollar cost averaging it in over the next year because there's just so much uncertainty right now that trying to put it all in at one moment would be a little bit daunting. Yeah. But you're basically saying not to get thrown by the temporary ups or downs and keep your keep investing the same amount no matter what's going on in the market. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Just writing it out. But it's difficult to do that emotionally. It might be logical. But talk about the emotions of doing that in a case like we have today. <laughs> yeah. the Like putting your money in right now, uh, especially over the next couple months, I, I would find emotionally very scary. Um, I think what helps me sleep at night is trying to get to a point where my like asset allocation is kind of driving uh, my emotional security. So you're investing up until your risk tolerance. So for instance, um, if you're trying to invest, let's say, 70% uh, stocks, 30% bonds, what you can do to feel like you have a little bit of emotional control during this time is maybe to rebalance your portfolio right now, or maybe if you've uh, experienced some losses, try to uh, sell some of those losses and tax loss harvest those parts to uh, kind of offset some of the gains you might have elsewhere. So there's some things you can do to feel like you have a little bit of control emotionally, even if the market is really still in control. Yeah, very good. We're going to take another break. Uh, this is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. My guest this hour is Adam Fortuna. Uh, he is a blogger and writer at the website Minify. You can find out more at minify.com. We'll be back after this. You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour is Adam Fortuna. He is a blogger and writer at the website Minify.com. Uh, his goal is to help millennials invest to reach financial independence much sooner than they ever thought possible. Welcome back to the show, Adam. Hey, thanks. Tell people a little bit more about what they can find at uh, Minify.com. Yeah, so uh, I started... Minify, uh, when I was still working as kind of a, a journal to help me kind of um, help uh, write about and keep myself accountable as I was saving for retirement. And uh, kind of as I started, as I was writing about it, I was kind of focusing on this intersection between minimalism, mindfulness, and early retirement. I kind of felt like they all kind of fit together in terms of like focusing on a goal and uh, kind of slowly working towards it. And uh, kind of over time, one thing that, that became really clear, both in writing on it and talking to people in my lives, 
in my life was uh, uh, this this uh, idea that like basic investing, like a uh, low fee index fund diversification diversified investing, is still something that I think most people maybe are a little daunted by and haven't known exactly how to get into it. Or maybe they're doing it a little bit in their 401k, but they haven't really uh, like put the the time into learning how it works. So maybe they're only just picking the stock that had the biggest return during the last year. And so I started kind of focusing on writing about that topic and uh, kind of how it relates to uh, FIRE in terms of like, if you invest now using this diversified approach, then you'll potentially be able to reach FIRE in uh, some number of number of years if you keep at it. So do you only recommend mutual funds and ETFs, uh, index funds, or do you recommend actively traded uh, mutual funds or individual stocks? What, what tools should people use to achieve what you're talking about? They, there's, a, there's a lot of ways there, that's for sure. Uh, I don't think there's any one way that um, is like the way. Um, I, people can do it with robo-advisors, they can do it with financial advisors, but it's going to be harder to do it with a financial advisor that's charging a 1% fee if you're able to get that same return using uh, just like VTSAX, like a Vanguard total stock market fund. So kind of what a lot of what I focus on is this uh, idea of like minimal investing. It's like the minimal things you need to know to learn how to invest long term. And uh, I kind of usually break it down into like four key areas. Uh, Understanding compound interest, which is something that I think most people kind of have gotten by now. Uh, the effect of diversification between uh, like U.S. funds, international funds, and bonds. Uh, the third one is uh, tax management. So, you know, how much tax you're going to pay on your investments, whether that's capital gains, maybe uh, ordinary income taxes as you withdraw from a retirement account. And then lastly is fees. That includes anything from financial advisor fees to uh, like expense ratios on actively managed funds or, or passive funds to uh, like front loads or purchase and redemption fees. And kind of after you have an understanding of those four concepts, you're really armed with the knowledge you need to really start investing on your own. And that's a good way to start finding out how to, if you are working with an advisor, maybe try um, like just managing your smallest investment account on your own for a little bit and see how that goes, both from a money standpoint but also from like a, a mindset standpoint, like are you, how do you feel managing this, maybe your smallest investment account? Are you scared to do it? And that was, that was one of the ways I started. And after managing that for a couple of years, I had kind of grown my confidence to the point where I was able to invest everywhere without a financial advisor. So that's one of the routes that I really uh, recommend people to, to take. So you're not saying people should necessarily just drop their financial advisors and go all to no load index funds, but it's be a gradual process to, to gain confidence before they do it. Exactly. There's a lot of risk there if you just drop it and do it on your own uh, because you are you don't know how you're going to respond when, let's say, something like the market drops by 30% in two weeks. You might instantly sell. Uh, I know I was actually investing with a financial advisor during the Great Recession in 2008. And when this all happened back then, uh, I was like, should I be selling this? And my, my financial advisor was talking me off a cliff like, no, no, this happens every once in a while. You should just uh, stick with it. We're going to rebalance, make sure you're matching your risk tolerance and write it out. And it ended up being really great advice that at the time I probably wouldn't have done myself. So I think it's a matter of working up to the point where you have that confidence to make those decisions on your own without someone there telling you, no, 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 <laughs> don't do that. So if you were an advisor today, <clears throat> to somebody following your advice, and they've been doing exactly what you say, put money into broad index funds, and the market's down 30 to 40%. What, what is your advice today with what's happening in the market now? Uh, yeah, I, I, one, for one thing, it'll depend on what the person needs short term. Like if they need, if they need money just to, to live, to pay bills, um, just to survive, 
then you really don't have much of a choice. If you, you kind of have to take some funds out. But if you're investing for retirement and this money is years and years away, um, I would say um, this is a good time to rebalance your portfolio. Make sure it's in line with your risk tolerance. Um, make sure that uh, you're diversified so that when the market does hopefully <laughs> start going back up, you're taking advantage of those gains. A lot of people that were investing back in 2008, 2009, kind of left some money on the sidelines because they wanted to put their money back in at the most opportune time. And then they missed years of growth. And then at that point it was too late and they kept holding it in cash. So a number of people ended up holding their money in cash for five years because they kept waiting for the next market drop. So there's a risk there by having your money out of the market that you miss the upsides later on. What is your outlook for how this whole coronavirus is going to play out both on the economy and on the market? Some people talk about a V-shape. Uh, some people talk about a U. Some people talk about an L. It's going to stay down for a while. <laughs> a lot of businesses will go out of business. What, what is your prediction as to how this is all going to play out in the next few months? Yeah, that's. I've been thinking a lot about that myself. And I know I'm just one more of the many, many guesses on this. Um, I have a feeling as soon as there's a vaccine announced for the coronavirus, we're going to see some slow, we're probably going to see some fast progress up and then some slow progress after that. And I have a feeling until then, we're going to be going down for quite a bit. I mean, right now, um, we haven't really heard March's unemployment numbers. We haven't heard uh, like the price, uh, the, the earnings calls from a lot of public companies that are probably going to start both cutting their guesses for the last quarter or, you know, cutting their numbers for the last quarter, but then also cutting their guesses for future earnings. And so all of that bad news on the economic side, I I have a feeling it's just going to lower stocks even more over the next couple months. And then as soon as hopefully <laughs> the vaccine is out there, then it'll probably start to rise. It's just a matter of when that happens. And so you think it'll be a very sharp snap back from a low level? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a like a little bit of a snapback, like you know uh, maybe 10, 15 percent of it comes back really fast. But I, I'd be surprised if it doesn't take another two years for the rest of it to recover. So say this goes on for a few months, that businesses basically have to shut down for let's just say three months before the the virus is is conquered in effect. A lot of businesses aren't going to be able to make it that far. Do you think the federal government and the Federal Reserve are going to be able to offer enough liquidity and support so a lot of these businesses come out the other side? Uh, yeah, that's that's such a hard question. I mean, I hope so. I hope that, um, I mean, I, I think no matter what you, what, what uh, legislation is going to have, going to be passed, a lot of companies are going to go into business because there's not going to be something that's going to be so broad that it's going to save every struggling restaurant, every gym that's been out of business. It's just going to be a lot of ground to make up. Uh, I hope that if something is passed, it can help both kind of stop some of the, the bleeding of it and help some businesses stay in place that wouldn't be able to survive. And a lot of households that are maybe not able, and able to afford their rent this month. But yeah, I mean, the government's been so so slow to act. I'm I'm, I'm optimistic and hopeful, but I, I, yeah, it's going to be hard. So what will the economy, so just take what you just said and take the next step. What would the economy look like, say, in a year from now, if a lot of those businesses, both large, medium, and small, don't make it through? Does that mean more concentration of economic power? Or what does the economy look like after this is all over, based on what you just said? I, I think in a way it's going to look a lot like the 2009 situation where there are a lot of companies that were going out of business and then the uh, people that were still, uh, or so a lot of people lost their jobs. And so that meant that the job market was kind of oversaturated with these very talented, skilled people. And a lot of the times that meant people that were just graduating college can people competing with people who had 25 years experience. And I have a feeling we're going to find ourselves in that situation again, 
where um, unemployment is going to start off pretty high and it's going to take a while for it to come down slowly as new businesses open and the number of, uh, after a lot of jobs are lost, the number of uh, new businesses starts growing slowly. But I have a feeling that's going to take probably a couple years. So it's, it, it, in the sharp downturn, then a slower recovery is basically what you're saying. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Just, just based on companies going out of business and small businesses either not being able to make it and new ones having to come in to fill their shoes. Very good. We're going to take another break. This is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. My guest this hour is Adam Fortuna. Uh, he is a blogger and writer at the website minify.com, which helps millennials invest to reach financial independence sooner than they ever thought possible. You can find out more at his website, minify.com. We'll be back after this. You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour is Adam Fortuna, a blogger and writer at the website minify.com. Uh, he helps inv millennials invest to reach financial independence, just like he did. You can find out more at his website, minify.com. Welcome back to the show, Adam. Hey, thanks. So you have some specific programs I just want to talk about. The first one's called the Interactive Guide to Early Retirement and Financial Independence. What can they learn from that one, and how can they get it? Yeah, so uh, Interactive Guide to FIRE was uh, something I put together. It was kind of based on this idea that uh, just reading an article isn't as interesting as an interactive article where you're actually putting in your own numbers and the article changes based on those numbers. So the graphs change, even the, the, the sentences change with placeholders based on your calculations. And uh, so I think this really makes um, understanding how the FIRE movement works a lot more fun than uh, just reading an article. And uh, you can get it for free over on my website, um, on the front page, the main main call to action links to it. It's a free article, and uh, it's kind of just a fun one to play around with. Great. And the next one you have is called the Minify Investor Boot Camp. What's in that one? So the uh, Minify Investor Boot Camp is a three-month boot camp to learn everything you need to know about how to invest on your own, handle taxes, plan for retirement, and grow your wealth using the stock market. And it includes, um, I think I'm up to five courses so far with five more planned. Um, some of them are text courses, some of them are video courses, uh, some of them have activities where you go off and complete things on your own, and some of them have a community aspect where you open up the, um, the Minify Slack group, which is like a, a chat group, and maybe get a little feedback from people in there. And uh, yeah, the boot camp's uh, uh, kind of in its pre-launch mode right now. You can get in for um, $129, which is like half the price. And uh, it's 100% free for teachers or anyone in the military uh, who wants to um, try it out and uh, go through it. So is there a whole Minify community that people can plug into and how does that work? There's, it's, it's small right now. <laughs> Minify uh, is not exactly a business. It's really just an expensive hobby. It just loses me money every month. But uh, I'm I'm having a lot of fun just helping people learn the basics of investing. And so for anyone who wants to join, they can jump on the, the Minify Slack group or feel free to email me with, um, with any questions if they're in the boot camp as well. And then the third thing you offer is the, Minify, the Minimal Investor Course. Uh, what's involved with that? Yeah, so the Minimal Investor course is the first course in the boot camp, but it's a, it's a free course. It's 10 articles or nine articles in one activity to give you kind of the rough draft of everything you need to know to invest. It's not everything, but it's really the basics. It's enough, I say, to, be, um, to, to understand everything that's going on in your 401k. Very good. So let's talk a little bit about real estate. So you have some very strong views on whether people should own real estate or rent real estate. What are the pros and cons there? 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, so first off, uh, a disclaimer, I feel like I had really bad luck with real estate. Uh, when, when my mom passed away when I was 23 and I inherited her house, uh, it was a uh, multi-unit property with a tenant in the back. And the tenant used that opportunity to just stop paying rent and destroy the apartment. <laughs> wow. It was, it was a, it was not a great place to be at 23 years old. It was, yeah. So, uh, eventually, uh, they moved out and they're like, yeah, my friend's going to move in. Uh, and I'm like, uh, that doesn't seem right. But luckily because of that transaction, I was able to like legally push him out. So, yeah, I, I had bad experiences with real estate. The other bad experience was that I, I decided to buy a house back in 2006 in Florida, right as the market was getting to its peak. So when I sold that house 11 years later, it was for it was for like a 20% loss after 11 years. <laughs> so yeah, uh, with that caveat, I really like renting right now. <laughs> um, for one, uh, I think I think it, there's there's different types of personalities, like ones that really love like having that that secure space that's theirs, and they they want to live there for the next ten years, twenty years, thirty years. I think for for people with that kind of personality, renting is or sorry, owning is awesome. And uh, likewise for people who kind of like the idea of being a landlord and growing their wealth that way. I think uh, uh, there's there's probably even more opportunity to make money as a landlord than as in the stock market, if you know how. There's also more opportunity to lose money as a landlord than in the stock market. Uh, so it really it really depends on how much time you want to spend on it. And for me, I wanted to spend as little time as possible worrying about my roof and mowing my lawn. So now I am a very happily enjoying apartment life where uh, if something goes wrong, we just put in a ticket to the the, um, the office downstairs and someone comes in and fixes it for free. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What do you think the whole coronavirus and the slowdown in the economy is impact going to be on real estate, real estate prices and rental prices and just how is it going to affect the whole real estate market? Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. I mean, I haven't thought about it too much. It's just kind of me just thinking off the top of my head. Uh, but I have a feeling that new home construction is going to be way down because people aren't, you know, out there building homes right now at the same rate they were. Uh, same, But also materials are probably going to be more expensive because uh, there's probably less shipments coming for, uh, for all materials. So I wouldn't be surprised if home prices drop for a little while. As uh, people don't have money, both to to uh, to buy those houses, I wouldn't be surprised if rents don't drop very much, though, um, because the people who are on the the landlording side still need to pay their their side of things. So there's only so far that rents can drop. Um, yeah, I, I I wouldn't be surprised though if the next two years are end up being a good time to, to buy buy a home for those who are looking, though. And how about the impact of mortgage rates, which have dropped to the lowest level ever? That, that does put people with a little bit of cash right now in a very good position. I know if I was looking to buy, I'd probably wait a little bit and see if the prices go down a little bit more before making that leap. But yeah, for people that are wanting to refinance, especially, this is a, an excellent time. Yeah. Uh, in the whole investing sec- uh, section of your website, you talk about the difference between speculation and investing. How would you define the difference between those two? Yeah. So I think this was something I didn't really understand when I started investing. Uh, so I define speculative investing as anything where you're really trying to time it. Like you're both trying to time when you purchase something and when you sell it. While investing, I consider that to be long-term investing. The price today doesn't matter too much because you're not going to sell it for, let's say, 10 years, 30 years, 50 years. And so uh, for most people that want to 
retire, most of their money should be in those long-term investments and not the speculative investments. And uh, for me, speculative investments go go to like individual stocks rather than like a, a mutual fund that tracks the entire stock market. Um, so what I do personally is, and I, I, I've read tons and tons of people who use a similar approach and they have about like, for me, it's 95% of my portfolio in these uh, like big ETFs, like total stock market funds. And the last 5% is reserved for speculative investments. Those are companies that I think have huge upside or uh, maybe it's the right time to buy them. Uh, but then I also have to be right about the right time to sell them. So it's a lot of work for that little bit of that little 5% of my portfolio that's speculative, but it it's both kind of fun and uh, it's an opportunity to potentially make a little bit more money than I would using the um, like total stock market fund. Also general, an opportunity how, to lose how, more money. <laughs> how have your speculative investments worked out? I'd say overall they've done better than the stock market. Um, some of them have done worse. Like for instance, uh, I know I in, I've invested in like uh, Apple and Tesla like um, many years ago when they were still growing a lot. But then I also invested in things like uh, Southwest a little bit after it had already peaked or Netflix after it was had already peaked. So it's a matter of picking the right company, but you also have to pick it early enough that uh, it's going to have a lot of upside. Uh, I think about like another one is like Bitcoin. Some people decided to do some speculative investing in Bitcoin. If you're only doing it with 5% of your portfolio, at least you can only lose 5% of your portfolio. Uh, And there's a potential of upside if you're in at the right time, if you feel like you know more than the experts do about something. And that's kind of my uh, like internal question whenever I'm making a speculative investment. Like, do I know more than the experts do about this? And like 99.99% of the time, that's no. <laughs> and that stops me from making a decision to buy something or sell something. And if it's something that I just have a really strong personal connection to, then I'm much more likely to put my money behind it. Um, like in this uh this month, I decided to move a little bit of money into Disney because my wife and I are, are huge Disney buffs. Like we're we're actually going to uh, Disney in California before FinCon this year, and you know we watch movies. My wife collects pins, so putting a little bit of money into that, especially after it had dropped like fifty percent over the last month, that was kind of a, an obvious one for us, and. Uh, those those ones are really rare to make, but we were happy with that decision. Very good. But you think 95% of the portfolio should be in index. And then how would you split that between stocks and bonds and cash, depending on people's age, roughly? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what I tend to lean on is it's less about age and it's more about the number of years until retirement. And for for us, we kind of went with this idea that at the year you retire, somewhere between 40 and 50% of your portfolio is in bonds and the rest is in stock. But before that, it could be as much as 90% stock and 10% bonds. And likewise, maybe five, 10 years after you retire, you can make it gradually a little bit more aggressive and go down to, let's say, 30% bonds and 70% stocks. So it's kind of like a, I think uh, Michael Kitsis calls it like a a bond tent where you're building up the bonds for the year you retire, and then you lower them down a bit after you retire. Even in this current environment where the stocks are falling, you still think that makes sense long term? I think so. Um, I think, like like for us, since we were using that approach, we had a lot less in stocks right now during this um, market decline than we would have if we were 100% stocks. Uh, I think we were about 30, 35% in bonds when the market declined. And that severely, um, significantly changed our uh, portfolio declines compared to if it was 100% in stocks. Right. Very good. We're going to take another break. This is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. My guest this hour is Adam Fortuna. 
blogger and writer at the website minify.com, which is helping millennials invest, and also he's in the minimalist movement as well. Check him out at minify.com. We'll be back after this. You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour is Adam Fortuna of the website minify.com. You can check him out at minafi.com. Welcome back to the show, Adam. Hey, thanks for having me. So what are some tax optimization strategies where you can keep your investments uh, and have them compound tax deferred or tax free until you withdraw the money? Yeah, there's a there's a lot of options there in the like tax world. At first, when I was learning how to invest, I had no idea that taxes played such a huge role in things. Uh, and I think some of the biggest ones that were shocking to me were just uh, how much taxes you pay in like the dividends from a stock every year if you're holding that fund in a brokerage account. So for instance, you have, let's say, a, um, you know, a total market fund or a, a real estate investment trust fund in your brokerage account. And you might be paying your ordinary interest rate, let's say 24%, on the dividends of that every single year. And that's money that's not compounding and growing. And uh, so one of the, the strategies to combat that is this idea of uh, tax, to, tax efficient fund placement. It's this idea that your most uh, tax inefficient funds should go in your most tax efficient buckets. <laughs> so that was a that was a mouthful. So the, the idea is things like a real estate investment trusts, bonds, things that give off the largest dividends, those make the most sense in your 401k, your IRA, or something where you're not going to have to pay taxes on it every year. And I think that's one of the first things that's really important to learn as you're learning how to uh, kind of diversify your funds across your different accounts. So you're saying to put income producing vehicles in your tax-free accounts where it's going to compound tax-deferred or tax-free, and then put more growth vehicles outside of an IRA or 401k because uh, you only take gains on it and it doesn't have any current dividends. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, later in the future, when you sell those funds, let's say you have some, have a, a fund that's grown you know, 1,000% in your taxable account, uh, if you're selling that, at a long-term capital gains rate, you can actually sell about 80000 of it every year and pay zero taxes if that was your entire income for the year, which is still kind of crazy to me that there's a way to sell capital gains and pay zero taxes, but that's the way the, the tax code is structured. So it helps to have those, those growth funds in your brokerage fund, your brokerage account. One of your sayings is that perfect is the enemy of the good that you should focus on basics rather than getting everything just right. Do people get kind of paralyzed into wanting to make sure everything's perfect and therefore they don't make any kind of move? Yeah, that, that happens a lot, especially when it comes to like getting your asset allocation just right and then tweaking it nonstop. There's this uh, concern that if you're tweaking it a lot, you, you might end up paying more taxes than you would if you just kind of set it up and let it go, even if it's not you know, right on your 20% target that you were going for. And uh, I think Fidelity did a study on this where they were um, tracking which funds had grown, the, or what, what account holders' funds had grown the most over the last decade. And uh, their highest performing group ended up being people who had passed away. <laughs> like that was, out, that was outperforming the people who were trying to do everything they could to grow their money. And so... There's this idea that the more the more uh, energy we put into managing something, the better it's going to do. But in reality, it's about getting it most of the way there and then just letting it go from there. So we're in a bear market now. If you want to be aggressive with that five percent of your portfolio that's speculative, what ways would you do? would you get into gold? Would you do inverse 
exchange traded funds? Would you go short? How would you aggressively try to profit from a bear market? Yeah, um, I I always look for the companies that are going to do the best in the current climate, and I think those are a lot of companies that cater towards um, people being at home. So you know whether that's companies that do teleconferencing like Zoom or Teladoc or like Blue Apron, who's delivering to your home, uh, DoorDash, companies that are um, profiting from door delivery. Uh, obviously, things like healthcare. Um, then there's the other side of it, kind of like you mentioned, inverse ETFs. Those are those are ETFs that go up when the stock market goes down. I tend to think those are okay, but at some point, the stock market's going to start going back up, and then those are going to drop. Um, so I would I would uh, look for those companies that are filling a niche of providing a service right now that is much needed, and a lot of people are jumping behind. How about the global markets? Uh, will the uh, global mutual funds be do better or worse in this kind of environment now? <laughs> yeah, I I wouldn't be surprised if some of them do better. Actually, um, I think. Uh, uh, Meb Favor have has this uh, analysis of like the price earnings for different sectors of the economy, from like the U.S. to international to emerging markets, and a lot of the emerging markets companies are probably some of the most attractive from a like a value for what they're providing standpoint right now. Um, I think you know globally everyone's going to be hurt by this in different ways, but. I think if the if someone falls, you know, if a if a um, country's economy falls 10% versus one that falls a lot more than that, there's a lot more room for um, recovery after the fact once like vaccines are in place and people can start going out and opening new businesses and uh, hiring new people. So you have a bit of a contrarian bent in you as well that you want to buy things that are high quality but down more than others uh, to be ready for the rebound. I think part of that's coming down to rebalancing. And uh, as you're rebalancing, the things you're going to be buying are the things that have dropped the most. Uh, so I know for us that involves selling some bonds and buying some emerging markets and some internationals because those have declined the most. But that kind of gets us back to where we were before, but hopefully able to benefit from the recovery from it as well. In the roughly two minutes we have left, why don't you kind of sum up how you think people can do well in this environment, running the kind of minimalist lifestyle uh, that you've been talking about? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> right now, I, I don't know about you, but I'm getting like overloaded by the news. <laughs> I think one of the biggest things you can do is like a step back, spend time with loved ones, you know, play some board games in the house, just uh you know, take a break from news <laughs> and find a way to, like, enjoy life a little bit, even if you're just cooped up at home. And then once you've done that, you know, start taking a look at your finances when you're ready. You don't have to do it today, but at some point and figure out maybe how you can um, get your asset allocation in a way that um, kind of sets you up to benefit from what will hopefully be a recovery at some point and uh, it doesn't need to be investing in a bunch of different things. It could just mean selecting, you know, three funds, maybe a U.S. international and a bond fund and kind of just setting your money in there and letting it grow from there over the next decade, which hopefully ends up being as profitable as the last decade and not something like Japan in the 90s. But I, for one, uh, believe that investing in something like VTSAX is investing in the growth of the country as a whole and uh, just growth of the world. So that's where I put my money. Very good. We've got some very calming advice in a very volatile time from Adam Fortuna. Uh, he is the blogger and writer at Minify.com, uh, which is a website to help millennials invest to reach financial independence sooner than they ever thought possible. And that certainly is comforting to hear in these very volatile days. So thanks very much for being a great guest on The Money Answer Show, Adam. Uh, thanks so much, Jordan.
Thanks, and we'll be back next week with another edition of The Money Answer Show. Goodbye for now. Thank you for joining Jordan Goodman and The Money Answer Show. If you have a question for Jordan, please visit his website at www.moneyanswers.com. And be sure to tune in every Monday at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time right here on Voice America Business. See you next week.